Okay, good afternoon. Let's start lecture. Uh, we're going to talk about the key design today. And then uh, Thursday, we'll talk about bearing. So after these two lectures, uh, you, sh you, sh we you should be able to get on with the design project completely. Okay? Yeah. Uh, before we start the key design, in the previous lecture on the shaft design, uh, I think I need to do a little summarize as to the general procedure of shaft design. Uh, if we got time, I'll go over the design project at the end of the lecture. Okay. Uh, ba basically, based on the example that we presented uh, from a previous exam from from previous lecture, you have the layout, you have the dimension of each each portion of the layout. Uh, you just don't have the diameter for each portion, and you don't have the fillet radius. Okay, you don't know basically the stress concentration. So in this particular case, okay, that's usually how you can approach this shaft design. So the first step when you do the design project. Uh, you need to have the layout of the shaft. Like the uh, assignments, I posted the number six, and uh, basically posted it, and that's the one of the question in the assignment number six. Okay, and I ask you to um, put down the layout of the shaft. Okay, at this stage, you don't need to uh, be specific about each portion or length of the portion, but okay, initially, okay, look at the results. Look at the Basically, a general description. Uh, you you probably will have to you will have to consider okay the length okay of each portion okay so not just the length because you're talking about layout of the shaft so you have to look at or think about those backing shoulders, okay, because it's going to be a stepped up sh shaft, okay. So it's going to be a step up shaft. So those backing up shoulder, right? How what will be the basically what will be the uh, the the structure that you wanted to use to fix the the components on the shaft, okay, at uh, rigidly at the desired location, okay. So those are need to consider. You need to consider the length of each portion, the backup shoulders. Okay, and uh, uh, what uh, what what com what fixture basically you intended to use? Okay, to fix it axially. So axial okay, direction. Okay, okay, fixation. So basically means the component right cannot move axially freely. Right, that's not going to be good. And uh, you can use snap rings. You can use a, a set screws. Okay, so you can use a spacer, right, to basically uh, fix these things at the desired location. And uh, lastly, you also have to consider to what component you're carrying. Right, so in the, in our case, it's pretty simple. It's just carrying gear, but in some other case, you may carry some other things. So um, those are in general what you need to consider when you design a shaft and lay out of the shaft. Okay, so of course the shaft will carry bearing, and there should be uh, the location for the bearing. Okay, uh, at this stage, early stage. Okay, you need to think about that. Right, where do you want the bearing to be? Okay, now this bearing here. You know, I'll put on the bearing here. Okay, for the bearing, uh, bearing involve the 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 waist, okay, basically how wide the bearing is, okay. But at this stage, you haven't designed a bearing yet, so you wouldn't be able to know the waist of the bearing here, right? So that has to be an estimate, approximated number here. So that actually, basically, uh, talking about is it's actually iterative. Once your bearing selected, you probably had to come back to the shaft, okay, and then to do another round of a calculation, okay? Yeah. So step number two is. Uh, in general, you need the force analysis. So that basically will give you the bending moment and the torque diagram. Okay. Yeah. 
So this is necessary so that you can see where the maximum bending moment is and where does the torque exist, right? So you need this information uh, to uh, for the next step. Okay. So step number three, okay, you have to make some assumption first. Okay, make some assumptions. For example, uh, what are the assumptions here? For example, what's the initial okay, values for KT and KTS? So the for the stress concentration factor. Because we don't know the size, the size, we don't know the radius, fillet radius, for example, and we have to take a guess first. So these initial values, they need to be conservative values. And the lecture notes in the textbook provided some guidelines in terms of the initial values for KT, KTS, for different uh, structures, for the fillet, for the casate, right? So you have a very some uh, some guidelines for conservative value, how conservative that is, okay? And you also need to make assumptions as to what's the radius of the fillet. At the shoulder location, you will have a fillet. At, um, you know, for example, the shoulder location for locating the gear or shoulder location for locating the bearing, right? And this are also needs to be uh, initial values. So we normally take 0 0.01 inch as an initial conservative uh, guess, okay? Maybe that that is going to be the final value you're going to use, right? Or maybe not. And uh, in final value, maybe you're going to use 0 0.02. Who knows, right? But initially, you can say 0 0.01, okay? <clears throat> and step number four okay, is uh, find the critical location. So based on the uh, structure of the, your shaft, based on the bending moment diagram and torque diagram, find the critical locations. So what are the critical locations in general? And uh, the critical locations is a, is a fillet location, is the key seat. Okay, so, uh, or maybe you have also a groove. So if you're using snap ring, so then you have a little groove for the uh, for the location of the snap ring, and those are basically location that will have this higher stress concentration, right? Yeah. So those are basically critical locations. Okay. Now step number five. is to do the calculation now. So in this case, what we do is you, you have to choose a design equation. There are a number of design equations. Okay, You got to choose the proper design equation based on the loading condition, right? based on loading condition. A loading condition means it, this is a fatigue loading. And uh, you have a combined loading. You have an alternating component. You have a mean component. Maybe you don't have mean component, only the alternate component. Maybe you have both, right? So you got to choose the design is equation properly, okay? To so deal with the loading condition, okay? Okay, for the right loading condition, and then you do the calculation, right? Calculate your d minimum. So the design equation is a d equal to something, and the, the the calculation of the of the results give you the minimum shaft diameter at that critical location. And when you do the calculation, as I pointed out in the previous lecture, your your design equation in general is in this format. So d equal to function of d. And uh, what we do is we you we can use uh, Excel to do this iterative uh, process. It'll converge a linear programming type of thing. It'll converge to a certain value. Okay. So in this case, check out that Excel uh, file for that uh, Excel file for that example. Okay. Yeah. So what you get it here, it's a minimum d, and of course the calculation at here, right? It's based on a given safety factor. So it's based on a given safety factor A and F. Okay. So that uh, safety factor 
in the design project is 2.5, I believe. Okay, so that's basically what you need to use to do your calculation. And step number six, okay, you get your minimum shaft diameter now, right? But that's probably not going to be the one that you choose to use. So the step number six is to make a decision. Okay, so make a decision on actual D. Okay, so we're talking about the D, not just one location. So I, I think I should say it's a DI because you have different locations, different critical locations, right? So you have, you, you're going to make a decision on the actual DI at each location. So what's the, uh, what's the considerations that you need to think about when you make a decision? So here's a list that I can think of, okay? Um, first for the DI, there is this D minimum, D minimum value. Because that's your basically everything that you choose has to be greater than this D minimum that calculated, right? Cannot be smaller than that. And second of all, you have to think about basically the ball size of gear and bearing. Okay, you have to think about this. So what the reason is is this: your your shaft is, let's say you're designing a shaft. And uh, uh, you find, okay, so this is, let's say, uh, this is the, the sh backing up shoulder here. And then, then you have, okay, you have your gear over here, okay. So you have a gear over here, okay. So uh, you basically, you calculate it, you find the D at this location with the minimum value you find using your design equation. Now, you go you you also design a gear right so you go to the commercial the website your your gear website okay and you find there is a off the shelf gear with a designated uh, ball size okay so maybe you don't have to customize your uh, your you know uh, purchasing of the gear so you can choose that ball size as the shaft size at the location right that's one consideration that makes sense right otherwise if uh, there is a significant difference, okay, then, then basically the uh, the manufacturer doesn't have the size that you are looking for, and then, then the available size is just too big, so you can use the customized size, right? Yeah. But if a customized size, it also has to be nominal size. One of the table in the textbook given it's a nominal standard size for uh, the shaft, right? Yeah. Same thing for the bearing, right? Same thing for the bearing. Okay. And uh, the next thing is you also need to consider is, so you figure out this D now, and if this side is a capital D, so there is always a suggested ratio between this capital D and a small d, uh, which is between 1.2 to 1.5. Okay, so there's this always suggested ratio. Okay. So now which one should you use then? Well, uh, one thing that I think I mentioned is when you look at the bearing catalog, Okay, if you look at bearings catalog, and uh, one of the one of the thing that specification is suggested is is a suggested shoulder height, okay, suggested shoulder height for bearing. So bearing catalog gives, okay, suggested shoulder height. Of course, that's the location for carrying the bearing, right? But that that value. Okay, eventually, you should take that into con some consideration when you try to make a final decision as to the shaft size, right? Yeah. Okay, so those are basically a couple of things that you, you need to consider it here okay, regarding the shaft design. However, in the end, okay, number seven, so after number six, you have the shaft size for different locations okay, on the, along the layout. And the last step is, you have to think about is, up to the step seven, it's the value you calculated based on assumed stress concentration factor, right? And also based on assumed uh, radius, uh, fillet radius. So the last step is you gotta basically bring it back. So now you got, a, you got your D now, right? Uh, find actual KT, KTS, okay? 
recalculate the safety factor. So recalculate safety factor. And make sure the capital value is greater than the required value. Okay? Yeah. So the final, basically, the final calculation is what you're looking for. You don't stop there and say, okay, that's it, right? But you already, you don't need to go anymore. So that because you started with a very fairly conservative value of KT, KTS, and other things, so the last round of the calculation is just showing people, here's my shaft design, and here is the actual safety factor based on your requirement, right? Yeah. If it turned out to be significantly, the safety factor here, significantly higher than the required one. Requires two, but you end up with a five actually, right? So you might want to think about is reduce the size factor, I mean reduce the shaft size diameter, okay? Yeah, because uh, that way you can basically reduce the cost, right? And uh, save some money. That make sense? So that's the general approach in terms of the shaft design here. It's an iterative approach, okay? An iterative approach, and um, you might find uh, too much of a calculation, but that's where that Excel template, okay, coming to the picture, is coming in handy, okay? So uh, when we talk about the shaft and the shaft carry component, and we mentioned that uh, how do we uh, basically uh, transmit the torque between the shaft and the component it's carrying. And one of the things that was mentioned is to use a K. So if this is a gear, if this is a shaft, so you can cut a, a, a K-seat here and then put a K into this K-seat as a coupling. So the torque can be transmitted between the two components here, right? Yeah, so this is basically the next part of the lecture. Let's talk about the K and look at the K design. Okay. K design. And what kind of a K can we use? Uh, definition of the K is fairly simple. Basically, uh, K right, is used to transmit torque. Okay. Uh, the key, of course, sitting in the K state. And there are two different standards for designing the K. I'll, I'll skip the writing. They're basically all ANSI standard. Uh, actually, a pretty old standard, 1967. They probably updated, but uh, <coughs> the textbook uh, didn't see anything about the new edition of the standard. So we'll just uh, use the same standard as it is. Okay. Now there are a t there are many uh, type of Ks. Okay. So let's look at the types of case. Okay, here's a figure. I'll show you what the types of case we're looking at. Um, very common one is the parallel case. Okay, very parallel case here. Uh, parallel case. There's a special kind of parallel case, a square case. Basically, the W at here is the same as the H. Okay, so when W uh, equal to H, it's square case. Okay, square case here. The second type is a, called taper K. Okay, taper K. So uh, the taper K, basically the surface here is a tapered surface. Okay, it's actually uh, not a gen, uh, not arbitrary uh, tapering in here. So the uh, this one here is they call it one eighth inch per foot. Okay, so that's sort of the uh, slope. Okay, yeah. And there are two different kind of taper K. One is called plane, the other called the gib head taper K. So uh, the, this is a plane one, and that's gib head. So the gib head here, there's a little protrusion in it here. And the purpose is actually just to facilitate the removing okay, of this case out of here. Okay? Just for zoom. But however, with this little protrusion, uh, it may also cause you know, some other problems. Maybe it'll get in uh, to ways of uh, some other objects, right? Yeah. But taper case are generally used uh, for uh, very tight uh, fitness. Basically, you slide it in and then you, uh, uh, you hammer it into this uh, the hub, okay, 
and the case state. So it's it's a pretty tight fit. Okay. Woodruff key is a <coughs> semicircular kind of a key, okay, and it's usually used on small shaft, okay, because it's a semicircular shape. So if you 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 cut into the shaft, okay, relatively deeper, okay. So because of the shape at here, okay. So that's Woodruff key. Now when you look at from this side here, the side view, it's pretty much look like the same thing as a as a parallel parallel key at here. So also got the width, also got the height. Okay, like this. Uh, in the uh, in, in if we got time, we'll look at this one here. Uh, in tutorial, maybe I'll give you an example of in terms of Woodruff key design. But today, we're focused is going to be on the parallel key at here. All right? Yeah. Okay. So let's look at the parallel key at here, and uh, how do we choose a parallel key, and how do we design? Okay, so in terms of the parallel case, uh, there are two tables. There's there's this actually which is one table in the textbook. There's this table seven dash six. Okay, as your reference. Okay, but I'll give you in the lecture notes. I give you another table with a, a more data in it. Okay, so this is the table seven dash six. Okay, so what this table tells you is basically if you have a shaft okay between uh, five sixteenths and seven sixteenths. You can choose uh, the case with the W with as a three over 30, 32 and H of three over uh, 32. Basically, it's a square K at here, right? It's a square K. Okay. Now the W, okay, the W at here, okay. In general, you take it as a one quarter of this uh, shaft diameter here. Okay. You don't want to be uh, more than that. So that's sort of a relative. Uh, recommended value, okay, the W. And the H depends on whether it's a red parallel or square K. So parallel, uh, the H is different from W. If it's a square, H is the same as W. The Kiwi depths basically referring to because the key is going to be okay putting in the K seat, right? Putting the K seat. So uh, the K seat, there's this height at it here, okay, this height. Okay, that's called the KV depth. That's basically half of this H at here. So this KV depth equal to okay half of that H over there, right? Yeah. So that's how you read this table. In the second rule here, when your shaft diameter is between seven sixteenths and nine sixteenths, you have two choices. You can either use a parallel K or you can use a square K. All right. You can either use a square K here. Now uh, the the other figure, okay, this figure here is not from the textbook, but in the lecture notes. Uh, this one here basically it's an extended table of the 7-6, because in the 7-6 the shaft diameter up to three quarter, uh, but here it goes beyond there, that, right? Yeah. So there is a little basically a footnote. It says values in non-shaded area are preferred. So which means if your shaft is below six and a half, okay, so you can use square K. So it's recommended for square K. If shaft is more than that, it's recommended to use okay, a rectangular K, okay, based on the standard ASI standard. Okay, so that's basically what this table means here. Any questions? Yeah, we're okay. good. So <clears throat> uh, I do I give you, I have given you another table in the textbook in the lecture notes. Okay. So this table here, the first two columns, are pretty much this. What's the information given over here? There's another column here. Okay. It's a recommended school uh, set school diameter size. So let's say if you have a uh, if you have a hub right here, okay, you have a gear, okay, and uh, it's probably uh, the shaft, okay, looking like this. Then you have a, a case seats, okay, at right here, okay. So um, in order to fix this axially, 
you can either use a snap ring here or use a, some spacers here or you can use a, a set screw over here okay you can use a set screw so basically the set screw has to be compatible with the uh, key that you designed how compatible you can pick that from this table at here all right yeah one is the inch one is the millimeter so that's the how would you use this table in the in the lecture notes okay is that clear yeah so if you don't use that's good then never mind okay so now in terms of the key size okay the material okay so keys are generally they're generally from low carbon steel okay okay um, when you design a K one thing that you got to make sure is they are you they're they are always negatively tolerant okay so what is the negative tolerance? Basically, if your key size, let's say, uh, if you look at your uh, waist here, let's say maybe it's a one, 0 0.152, okay? So it's always minus, okay, okay, 0 0.002 and the tolerance like this. So what this basically means is your key is a slightly smaller than the key seat. So you can very easily put the key in the key seat. Okay, there's no tight fit. Okay, yeah. So this is a critical because when it's tight fit, you you you, you could have a, a, a potential problems, right? And uh, you you don't want to basically uh, cause any damage before uh, it's being used. All right. So that's the part of the key here. Uh, when you design the key lengths, okay, the key lengths is actually one of the design parameter that you will choose. Okay, so uh, as you can see from the uh, from this figure here, from this table here, from this table, if you have your shaft diameter, okay, you have your shaft diameter, you will be able to determine the width and the height, right? You will be able to width and height. But you just don't know what uh, what uh, proper length would that be, right? So that's actually one of the design uh, part here. So you need to design or calculate uh, the uh, the key lengths here. And I will talk about how how to determine this key length L, or how to design the key lengths. Okay. However, there's a general guideline is the L shouldn't be more than 1.5 of the shaft diameter okay so the l should be uh, less than 1.5 because that if it's too long then you cause unnecessary twist okay. if one key if you think if your design l has to be greater than 1.5 d then what you can do is you instead of using just one k, one k you can use two k's okay so basically you can orient the two k's at a certain angle okay usually they're 90 degrees apart or 180 degrees so to basically to satisfy your desired uh, requirement for transmitting the torque okay yeah so use multiple k's if necessary Okay. Yeah. So, lastly, very important point is the case are supposed to function as a mechanical fuse. So, when you design a key to to transmit a torque between the shaft and the gear, you don't want the shaft to fail first. You want what? The key to fail first. Right? So, that's basically we call that uh, a mechanical fuse. So design the basically design such that okay the key 
fails first. Okay, yeah, that's sort of a general uh, guideline here. All right. So in other words, uh, when you design for uh, the safety factor, safety factor for the case compared to the safety factor for the shaft, it should be bigger or smaller. Smaller. Yeah. Okay. So there are situations is, okay, so what if uh, I cannot prevent the decay fill first, you know, the shaft, you know, it has to be the shaft or bear or the, uh, or the hub or the gear hub uh, feeling first. So that's a different issue. So we'll talk about that uh, later. All right. Yeah. But that's in general, this is what you need to be careful here. Okay. Yeah. So in terms of the tipper key and the wardrobe key, uh, take a look at the lecture notes and and, and uh, the wardrobe key, I'll, uh, uh, um, you know what? Well, let's let me talk about the Woodrow key a little, just a little bit here. Okay. Okay. Let's talk about the Woodrow key just a little bit and how we read the table, and then we'll co go back to the parallel key in terms of design. All right? Yeah. Okay. So this this is the Woodrow key. The table that uh, you're going to resort to, table 7-8, okay, as uh, general, and there's another one, 7-7, inch series, okay, and there's another one here in the in the uh, in the lecture notes, which is this one in here, okay, which is this one here, okay. So let me uh, talk about this Woodrow K, but I think I'm going to use the uh, the diagram at here. Okay, the dimension, the diagram here in terms of Woodrow K here. So here's a semicircular Woodrow K. Where is it from? It's cut from basically part of the circle here. But it's not necessarily half a circle. It's actually somewhere a little below this half circle. Okay, so that's the, the shape, the front view of this uh, Woodrow K. Right? In terms of dimension, because it's coming from a circle, so the B at here refer to the diameter of that circle. F here refer to the actual length, basically where where is actually from. And you also you also have the width or the thickness of the Woodrow K. All right, yeah. So uh, also the height, basically from here to here, that's the height of this. Now from the center of the circle, okay, to this location here is called E, and that's where in the textbook you see that's called the offset, okay, the E over here, right? That's E. That's how you read the table. So, in terms of the reading here, when you pick the Woodrow K, you look at the catalog, they generally give you the key number, so 202, 204, or 608 like this. So what are we what what are they representing? They basically tells you the size the size of W and the B. What is the W? W is the width the width and the B is the circle diameter here, right? The circle diameter. So actually there's a little trick right here in terms of the interpreting these numbers here. The the last two digits, okay, the last two digits here refer to basically how many eighths of an inch. So for example, you have a two at here. So that's basically uh, so that's basically yeah so the so that's two over here that's two times okay there uh, uh, two times this give you the W at here. So give you W over there. Okay? Yeah. And the B the first digits, the two there, uh, just a second here, uh, f two, four, four times, no, the, fir the last two digits, two times, The last two digits times one eighth. Yes, the last two digits, right? It's this b equal to the last two digits times 
times one eighth. Okay, times one eighth. And the W is the is the first digit. All the basically all the digits preceding the last two. The first two or one digit times one over thirty two. Okay? So that'll give you the W value. Right? Yeah. But anyway, it really doesn't matter. If you look at the number, you'll get uh, what it is there. Okay? Yeah. So once you have the key number, you can also figure out uh, what the actual F is, the actual length F, okay, and what the height of the keys, okay, based on here. Okay. Now there is a little a range here though, okay, for a typical geometry B less than one quarter inch. It's this one here for B is greater than one quarter one and half one and a half inch. It's this one here, right? So that's Woodruff K. Okay. Anyway, so take a look at this one here. This is not in the textbook, but to compare this one with uh, the textbook figure here. Okay. If um, uh, just in case you use Woodruff K. All right. Yeah. Okay. So now let's talk about the K design here. So we're talking about the K. Parallel key design, though. Okay. Okay. So I'll list some uh, general uh, steps that are here, okay, so that you can follow. Okay. Before you do the key design, you have to complete the shaft design. Okay, got to complete the shaft design first. And then based on the sh based on this uh, uh, based on the shaft design results, which is basically the shaft diameter, you can pick or select okay, the key size. Okay, from table. So that's essentially W and H are determined. Okay, W and H so what you need to do is you need to figure out the length of that but in order to figure out the length of that we need to specify the material for the key okay so for example in the uh, Nam project as we suggested is a 1020 codo steel Okay, so that's for example that if that's the material, right? That's the material. Then, if the material is given, so determine the yield strings. Okay. So determine S Y T for K for shaft and the hub. Okay, and the hub. So the K sitting between the shaft and the hub. The hub basically uh, is a hub for the gear or the pinion or some other uh, components. Okay, yeah. So determine the SYT for these things here. So generally the SYT for the K will be smaller than the shaft and the hub. Basically you have a less strong K than the shaft and the hub, right? Yeah. How do we complete the shaft design if we don't know what size we can be using because we don't actually know the depth? Uh, that's a good point. Yeah, but uh, um, when you design for the shaft, right, let's say you pick the critical location for the case seat and uh, you, you assume the, the fillet radius or the case seat stress concentration <coughs> factor, you have the, basically you calculate the shaft, you consider basically not reduce the portion of the shaft diameter. It's the original size of the shaft diameter, right? So that actually doesn't affect your basically your shaft design. You, you know what I'm saying, right? Basically, all you need to do is to cut a case seat, right? And and uh, basically, how deep that you're gonna cut the the case seat at the location. But that part can be done after you design the key. When you but when you when you design for the shaft. The, you, you said, oh, critical location at the case seat, and uh, you assume 
basically initially certain kind of stress concentration factor. Then you calculate to get a d minimum at the key state, right? Yeah. So that's okay. Okay. So there are two different cases though, right? Case number one is the key. Okay is basically least strong and case number two okay case number two is what I said this kind of special kind of case uh, which usually don't happen but if it happens is basically somehow your K right is not the least strong material maybe the shaft is or maybe the hub is okay then in this, in this each one of this situation here doesn't matter what you do you need to basically get the minimum basically value okay that's the value that you're going to use for the next step of design okay for the next step design yeah so the key, are we only designing against shear stress or are we including good point yeah we we're, we're going to actually consider two different stress okay. yeah i'll talk about that just in a moment yeah Okay, so um, so after you determine this one here, and you design, right? You design here. So what if uh, basically if L for the K, okay, if L for the K turn out to be too long for the hops length. So you design, you find that L, I'll show you how to design, is too long for the hops length. Then in this particular case, <coughs> then you have to basically means what? Means the key material maybe is too low, right? You have to pick a little bit more stronger key material here. Okay? Because your key, you don't want to be uh, extruding out of the hop, right? Otherwise, it's not transmitting basically uh, the required torque. Okay, so uh, number six is to specify the okay, actual key size. Okay, actual key size. Specify actual key size meaning uh, you look at the catalog, right? You don't choose paste the decimal numbers. You look at the catalog, choose the proper one off the shelf so you can buy. Okay, so that's what the, this step here. Some of the consideration is uh, when you do your modeling, your K seat or K, okay, your K seat or K shouldn't run into the stress concentration location. So let's say, for example, if this is the shoulder, okay, if this is shoulder here, and uh, you have a stress concentration at the shoulder, but if you cut your K seat right at this location here, right? So that won't be good because the why? Because you have a basically two stress concentrations happening almost at the same location, right? Yeah, so that's what you need to avoid there. So they shouldn't run okay, into okay, other stress concentration location. Okay, and uh, the last step, okay, is to use your CAD software to cut the case it properly. So that actually sounds like a simple problem, but it has to be cut properly. So I'll show you what the dimension is. Uh, how would you be able to cut properly? Okay, so cut case it or dimension the case it okay properly. Okay. Properly meaning the dimension has to be accurate. All right? Yeah. Okay. So let's look at the actual design process. So we look at design example, and uh, basically, as the looking ask, uh, what stress do we consider when we're designing for the key? Okay. 
So here's a simple diagram right here okay, in terms of a uh, uh, key sitting between the shaft and the hub. Right. So this is the shaft, and this top portion is the hub. Right. Yeah. And the key is here. Uh, in actual situation, remember what I said. The dimension of the key is actually slightly smaller than the key seat. So really, uh, what is what it what they what they really look like is like if I exaggerate it a little bit here. So let's say this is a shaft, okay, key seat. Then uh, the uh, hub, okay, the key seat. So the cup is actually somewhere here. Okay, the top portion of the hub. And the key is probably sitting like this. Okay, probably sitting like this. So then you have a force at here and here. Okay, because the torque is transmitting. So there's a slight gap at here. Okay, slight gap. Is that good? Yeah. And there's also a little gap at the top there. Okay? Very little. Okay? Yeah. Okay. So how do I get the force, right? This is the force basically uh, before coming from the torque. Uh, there's the torque transmitted. So of course the torque equal to T divided by half of the shaft diameter, right? So that's very easy. So that's your torque. Okay? T. Okay? Now, if I look at the loading condition of this one here, uh, we basically will mainly uh, consider two different kinds of stresses. Okay, one is called a direct shear. Okay, one is called direct shear, and the other is one called is a bearing compressive shear. Okay, Bearing compressive shear. So what is the direct shear first of all? That's quite easy. Because the, sh the, the key is under the, the force from the shaft okay, and the force from the hub. So basically, we consider basically there's a direct shear right at this location, this dash line location, the cross section at the dash line location. That's a direct shear. Okay? That's a direct shear. Bearing compressive shear, it's meaning it's the next diagram. Okay, I'll show you there. It's basically you're looking at is this the force is acting okay on the surface, on the side surface of this case at here. So this surface basically that's from where? That's from the hub here, right? That's from the hub. So that basically the bearing compressive stress from the hub should be the same as bearing compressive stress from the shaft, right? Yeah, so we can do we just have to look at one here. Um, this is a compressive stress, that's a sh direct shear stress, so slightly different though, okay? And when you come to design, okay, we need to consider the both of the situation here. Okay, so let's look at the design equation uh, based on each one of the situation in here. Okay? So let's look at the direct shear first. Okay, let's look at direct shear. So if it's a direct shear, first of all, we need to figure out what is the direct shear stress. So let's say we call that tau. Okay, direct shear is this tau here. Uh, direct shear basically is the force divided by area, right? So the shear area. The shear area is area at this cross section here. So that's what? That's the width. So this side is width here. This is width. That's the width times the length, right? Times the length. Okay, so that's one over W by L. So that's the shear area. And F is that quantity over there, T over, okay, capital D over T. Okay, so overall, uh, this gives us a shear stress, which is two T over D W L. Okay, D W L. So capital D is the shaft diameter.
thing, right? Yeah. Okay, so let's say we're going to use maximum shear stress theory, okay, for the design. And of course, in this case here, we're considering the a static loading condition. Basically, the torque is a constant torque, okay, it's not uh, varying. A torque. If it is it, if if it is a varying torque, then you're gonna have to use this uh, fatigue loading, uh, fatigue design equation. Okay. So let's use a static one here. So let's use the maximum shear stress theory. Okay. Maximum shear stress. Maximum shear stress theory says safety factor n equal 0.5 SYT over uh, the uh, uh, tau max, okay, here we're tau max here, okay. So if the direct shear, the tau max basically the same as this quantity here, okay, the same as this quantity. So in other words, um, you can, you, what you can calculate is, you can do this, right, design basically means you have the design safety factor n, so n is known. So you will have this n here. So n if n is known, that means what? That means you can have the the the, the maximum allowable is it's this, right? That's your allowable one. And that's why t is also known. You have the material, you have this one here. So if this is the allowable one and this is the actual shear stress, so just let this equal that, right? Then you can get the minimum length L. Okay? So, so let it equal 2t over dWL, okay, so let it equal to each other, solve for the L, okay, solve for the L, so L will equal to 4n capital T over SY, okay, capital D and the W, okay, yeah. So W will be uh, selected based on the size, okay, yeah, chances are be quarter the D. Okay, so that's basically a uh, design equation uh, coming from this MSS based on the situation of a direct shear, okay, consideration. So the next one is, let's consider that bearing compressive shear. Uh, not, not shear, bearing compressive stress. Okay, the bearing compressive stress. And this is the, the, the diagram I was just showing here. Bearing stress, okay, the, the key feels the same bearing stress from the shaft and from the, uh, as well from the, the, the hub. So we can just simply look at the bearing stress from the hub here. So how much bearing stress uh, does it feel then? Let's say the sheeted area here, okay, let's call that AC, the area is AC, okay, here is AC. And uh, this is the total force, right, acting on this AC here. So which means the sigma, right, will equal to the force over AC, right, that's your bearing compressive stress, okay. And AC equal to half of the H shaded here times L. So half of H times L. That's AC. And F is the same as before. It's capital D over, uh, capital T over half of the diameter, right, of the shaft. Okay, so that's the sparing compressive stress. When you calculate the bearing compressive stress, uh, we actually in this case here, it doesn't really matter whether you have fatigue or static loading. You always just use the maximum force, okay, maximum force uh, for the calculation of this bearing compressive stress. And because this is always a compressive force, okay, compressive force, it's not a tension force. So, uh, as we learned, when we're dealing with fatigue loading, we said what? We said uh, the fatigue or the crack propagation only happens when it's under tension, right? Tensile stress. So when it's actually bearing this kind of a bearing stress at here, okay, we just we don't need to consider the fatigue failure. Just the static equation will be enough. 
okay, because it's always compressive here. Okay, so uh, next is to choose a failure equation. Okay, choose a failure equation. Uh, if I draw basically a, a stress elements here, and this is your sigma, right? It's under compressive. If you draw your mole circle, okay, so it basically it's a mole circle looking like this, okay? And this is your sigma here, negative. And your maximum shear stress, the tau, is sigma over 2, right? Sigma over 2. So really, you, you don't, it doesn't matter whether you choose the maximum shear stress or the distortion energy. Because when, it, when it's ductile material, we, we had two different theories. One is MS, the other is distortion energy. So both theory, in this particular case, give us the same results. Okay? Same results. Okay? So if it's MSS, your N equal to 0 0.5 SYT over okay, uh, tau max. Okay, over tau max. So what's the tau max? Tau max is half of this sigma, right? Half of the sigma here. So that's 0 0.5 SYT, half of the sigma. Where's the sigma? Sigma is this guy here. Okay, that's this. Okay. So plug it in here. Solve for the L. We can get our L is 4NT over SY capital DH. Okay, capital DH. If you want to use if we want to use the DE, you'll end up the same thing. If you use a DE, it's gonna be N equal to SY over sigma prime. Okay. A sigma prime in here, looking at the state of stress, it's basically sigma. Okay, it's really so that's the same thing as MS here. Okay, as MSS. Okay. So ultimately, you get one equation out of here and one equation over here based on the two uh, different stresses, right? Two different stresses. So if you compare these two out of here, where's the difference? The only difference is where? W? And H. So, yep. Um, for your L equation, there should be H. So you have a half H, or a H over 2. Here? Yeah. So, since in your L equation there that you highlighted in red, H T. H T. Or H N T, sorry. Uh, so there's a D over 2, H over 2, so is that 2, 2? That's this 4 from, right? Yeah, and then you also have the half from here. Ah, uh, yeah. See, this 0.5, this 2, they cancel each other. Yeah. So this is a correct, okay? Yeah, correct. So, as we said, the only difference is the W and H. So basically means, um, if it's a parallel K, right? If it's a parallel K, then the calculation for these two L are different. But if it's a square K, so really you can calculate either based on the direct shear or either based on the bearing compressive stress. So the two design equation is the same thing. That makes sense, right? For square K, W equal to H. Okay? Yeah. So same equation, okay? But for parallel K is not. Okay, for parallel K? For parallel K, in general, H is less than W. Okay, H is less than W. If H is less than W, which means the L calculated based on the bearing stress will be higher than the L calculated based on the direct shear stress, right? <coughs> So in, our, in other words, which one, which L would you choose? You actually just have to choose this one here, right? Choose the longer L, okay? Yeah. So in this case here, if this is parallel K, when you do the design, you really just have to use this, this one only, okay? This one only, okay? Yeah. All right.
So that's the uh, uh, that's basically uh, design the process at here. Okay, design process. So um, before we move on to an example here, uh, I did mention in the process, you know, there's two cases. The, there's a special case is the key is not the least strong uh, the material. So there probably shaft is a less strong, hub is less strong. So in that particular case, now in this basically, uh, when you design for the L, instead of say you're saying you design L for the K to prevent the K from failure, you actually design for the L to prevent the shaft or the hub from failure. Because the bearing stress, right, not just the, not just the uh, K feel the bearing stress, and what, the uh, hub or the shaft surface also feel this bearing stress, right, bearing bear stress. And if the shaft is not as strong as the uh, K, so then basically you want to design L so that the shaft doesn't feel uh, under this bearing stress. So that's the issue. But the, in our case, we um, we are trying to avoid that uh, special problem, right? Yeah. So let's take a quick look at example at here as to a concrete K design uh, problem. Okay. So let's say after some design, we end up our shaft diameter is 25 okay, millimeter. Okay, 25 millimeter. And uh, the shaft is transmitting a horsepower 15 kilowatts. The uh, shaft is rotating at a 720 RPM. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now we pick our key material, and uh, such that S Y T is 460 newton per millimeter square. Okay, so that's a mega pound. Let's see, we're designing for safety factor of three. Okay, safety factor three. So let's see what's the proper length or what's the proper key size we're going to choose. Okay, yeah. So first we need to figure out uh, the torque. Okay, so the, we need to figure out the torque because you look at uh, the, the formula here, so we need that torque to do the calculation. Okay. And the torque equal to the h over omega. Okay, so that's watt. Okay, this is a watt, and this is reading per second. Okay, it's reading per second. And uh, in terms of uh, kilowatts, okay, and uh, RPM, so it's 9.55 and h over n. Okay, h over n. So h at here is watts and that's how much 15 kilowatts so 15 times 10 to the power of 3 and rpm is 720 so that's how you calculate the t and t calculated to be okay, newton uh, millimeter okay the results here is a newton millimeter here okay we we'll change that to millimeter because my shaft diameter is 25 millimeter Okay, so, so once you get this now, now let's calculate. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Uh, let's see. When, 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 uh, okay, let's say we we decided to choose a square k. Okay, if I choose the square k, so really we don't need to calculate the direction. We just have to calculate the bearing stress there. Okay, so let's call that the bearing stress. Okay, let's call the sigma c. Uh, sigma C allowable and uh, sigma well just just call it sigma allowable maybe. Okay. So allowable bearing stress is SYT over the safety factor N. Okay. And that equal to 460 over 3. Okay. There we go. That's allowable one here. All right, so now let's calculate the length of the K. So we decided to choose a square K. Okay, if we decide to choose a square K, then uh, first for the width of the K, let's use that as one quarter of the shaft diameter. 
Okay, use the one quarter of that. And why do we choose? Why do we want to choose a square key? Because what's the current diameter that you have? It's 25 millimeters, so just one inch, right? And in one of the table I mentioned, when your shaft size is less than six and a half inch, it's recommended to use square key. All right? Yeah. And then not that the rectangular key won't work though. Okay. So that's what we do at here. So that which is why you choose a square key. Okay, so one quarter D, so that'll give me 6.25, right? 6.25 millimeter. Okay. So if I look at the table, 7 6, let's see, where is 7 6? So this is 7 6. Uh, Actually, there's no millimeter here, right? I don't need to double check. There's no millimeter here. Well, let's look at this guy here. Well, uh, maybe let's do this guy here. So, actually, when you look at this one, it's 25. You use an 8, right? But I think I'm going to use a 6 in my case. When D is 25 here, they use 8 for the width. It it's okay. I will use six here. If I use a six set here, then my length will be just slightly longer, right? Yeah. So I'll choose a six set here. So I'll choose W equal to six. So that's also going to be the H. Okay. It's going to be this H there. Okay. So then let's calculate the L. And to calculate the L, okay, so L equal to 4NT over SY, capital D, W. The capital D here is a, this actually is small d, right? So I choose that to be the small d that we're looking at here. Shaft diameter, okay? Okay, so plugging all the numbers, it's 4, uh, N is safety factor. Yeah, so let's be careful with N here. I have two, this is N is a, uh, Rotation. This N is a uh, safety factor. Let's use N D maybe. This is N D. Okay. Yeah. So that's a three and T. Okay. S Y T four sixty twenty five and six. So calculate this thirty four point six millimeter. Okay. Thirty four point six millimeter. Okay, so you look at like, uh, look at uh, table 8-17. Okay, 8-17 for a nominal length in terms of millimeter. Uh, the next nominal value is probably 35. Okay, if there's no 35, then choose the next one. Okay, yeah, it was 35. So basically, the final selection of the key is what? 6 by 6. By 35, okay. By 35, okay. Is that good? Yeah. So it's actually not bad. The, the key, the key design is it's, it's probably uh, the uh, easiest part in terms of the whole design process here. All right. Yeah. Last point I want to make is what will be the proper cut, okay, on the shaft to generate the K seat. It actually seems to be a pretty small issue here, but uh, you got to be careful because maybe I won't be able even to tell actually, you know what I'm saying? Because I want to look at the detail, but uh, when it really comes to the manufacturer, that, that, that could be a common issue if you don't cut it properly. So if you look at the actual dimension here, this is the hub here, okay? This is the hub. So basically there is a circle here, right? If I in enlarge the circle and uh, that circle supposed to be, you know, basically like this. Okay. Now, when you after the cut, it's at here. So there is a little distance between the top edge and the location at here. So that's called the Y. That's called the Y here, right? The Y. And the Y is called quarter height. It's called quarter height. And uh, if you, uh, I mean, if you use a uh, SolidWorks. 
let's see if I if this is the sh if this is the shaft if this is the shaft here, and then of course you have a round shaft here. So now you said, okay, I'm going to do a cut now, right? I'm going to do an extruded cut. So when you do an extruded cut, and you probably you, you will here's your key. Here's your key your key designed uh, here, right? So you're going to snap the key somewhere here, and to cut it right through the shaft. So the problem is, where would you do? Where would you how? Where would you draw that square or rectangle? so that to generate the proper chordal height, y, which is given by this one here, okay? That make sense? Yeah. And uh, one of the, uh, one of the bottom line is, remember, half of the key is in the shaft, and half of the key is outside the shaft. Basically, this is half h over 2, right? So you can, Use dimension to proper do the cut, or there's a another shortcut. Just snap the middle of the this one here with the edge of the circle, so you guarantee that it's snapped at the right location, right? Then you do the extruded cut. You know, you have the right uh, case seat. Okay. Uh, other dimensions given here, so just look at the lecternose, so it's not a critical, okay? Just for manufacturer point. So that's roughly the idea of the uh, of the key design. Any questions? Okay. So I will use the rest of the time to go over the design project, okay? Just a couple of issues I wanted to uh, emphasize, okay? If you have read the design project, okay? Um, it's basically a fictitious kind of application. Uh, it's used a single stage of gearbox and driving a propeller, okay, uh, through some shaft right here. Okay. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, two years ago, there was a, in, a global student from Norway, and he has a family business uh, from his dad and grandpa, has been for a few generations. So, and he, when he was looking at the project, he said, that's exactly what he had, his family has been doing in the past uh, 100 years or something. They, bas they basically built uh, a gearbox for a uh, boat and a small size of ship, right? So, here is uh, a list of uh, specifications here. They seem to be pretty overwhelming here, okay? Lots of things going on here, including all the specifications for the shaft, for the bearing, for the case, okay, for the gear, okay. Uh, read them uh, carefully, okay. Uh, but the number, of, number, of, a couple of things I wanted to uh, point is I limited uh, certain options for you. Uh, number one is I limited the, the diametral pitch to be within four, six, eight, nine, ten. So don't go anywhere uh, other than those numbers, okay. Yeah. I also limited the material for the gear pinion and also the material for the shaft. Okay, for the shaft. Because in the past, it was a really open-ended project, and I find that the people uh, use some shortcuts, they find a very strong material. That's it, it satisfies the material <laughs> requirements, right? So, and also, maybe they just give me a ridiculous big size of a shaft, and uh, uh, of course, that is going to satisfy the safety factor. So. The purpose is, okay, you're not just doing a calculation. Now, when you're going through this one here, it's 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 one of the what I call when I look at it, look at how how are you optimizing the process? How are you making decision? Are you making a rational decision? Or are you making a random decision? Is the process iterative or is the process of basically a random uh, playing around with Excel to come up with a safety factor, right? So that's basically what, what I'm trying to look for uh, uh, from your report, okay? So for example, uh, three materials for the gear and pinion. And uh, if you look at the, uh, the last week tutorial, uh, we had one, e one design basically uh, consideration is, if you know the material, how would you properly determine diametral pitch and the number of the teeth, right? So look at that the tutorial. If uh, you don't know the material, if you, let's say you assume that you don't know material, then how would you go 
based on assumed diametral pitch and gear number number of teeth to end up with proper gear uh, specified material, right? Yeah. I think in this case here, because the material is given, you need to probably go backwards, okay? Based on the three different given material, what will be suggested, okay, uh, values for based on the three different material, okay? Same thing for the shaft, okay? Uh, you probably will have a little comparison in the end, okay, based on the table you created as to what will be the a decision that you're going to choose, okay, based on these uh, comparisons, all right? Yeah. So, in terms of the bearing, okay, we are, we're, we're going to look at that this Thursday, okay, so after that, uh, uh, we uh, should be able to, uh, uh, nothing new there anymore, it's all there, okay, that's the bearing part. Uh, number of uh, uh, templates have been updated up and uploaded to the to the Blackboard. Okay, so you're not just restricted to templates that upload to the Blackboard. Some Excel files that are used in lecture notes, some Excel file in assignments in tutorial, you open them. You know you can also take uh, take them uh, as as your uh, your template, or you can modify it to combine into one of your own. Uh, file, right? Okay, so feel free to modify them. So t that's basically the specification. Now, in terms of the uh, design consideration and uh, requirement here, so look at this. Look, look, some just look at the roughly the guidelines here. You know, I'm uh, I'm trying to emphasize this. Basically, I'm looking at is the procedure. You know, how are you approaching this problem here? Okay. Are you just uh, giving me two or three pages? Here's Excel. Here is this uh, results here, and uh, they satisfy your satisfaction, the safety factor, right? And uh, without showing any uh, design process or any design consideration, that uh, that wouldn't be a good report. Okay. Yeah. So in the end, uh, what I'm trying to look at is, uh, I don't need you to show me that every formula that you used, you can just refer to the textbook or the lecture notes as to the formula that you used, right? Yeah. And of course, you got to make sure that you have the right formula, use the right, if you're entering yourself, uh, make sure you enter right, okay? And uh, if you have a tables, you don't need to include every table in your report, right? Because just refer to that uh, right source. Uh, more important is, uh, it's as I said in your report. It's how and uh, what's your process. Now solid modeling is uh, not a big chunk of the project because we're not the manufacturing class. And uh, but I do wanted to see because I have taught you how to draw the gear and the shaft is not that big deal. Okay. Uh, in terms of the gear box, the casing, I, and uh, you know just anything that will be do. Okay, it will do. Uh, it doesn't have to be very fancy. Okay. And for those people who has who hasn't taken manufacturing class, I'll right, write you all. You are taking manufacturing class, right? It, some of the, I know some of the past students they made it their one of the project and basically they manufacture a little gearbox in the manufacturing class, right? Yeah. So I know some of you talked to me wanted to use 3D uh, printer, but uh, frankly speaking, uh, I don't think uh, that's gonna give us a, a good. It's probably just a, a toy, you know. So uh, we'll skip that part, okay? Yeah, and uh, I'm thinking you, you can't use a 3D printer to print a bearing. You still need to buy the bearing there, right? Yeah. Can you? The bearing? Have you printed using the 3D printer for bearing? Yeah? Uh, we've, never, I've, we've never used it. Yeah, me either. So I, I don't think you can use a, a 3D printer to print a bearing. You need a, you, you, you have, you need a, you, it's assembly, right? You know, you can assemble the balls and the uh, rings together. It's not uh, one piece, okay? So uh, anyway, uh, present your CAD model and the report at the end of the term, April 7th, all right? In terms of the group, I expect to be two or three. If there are four maximum and if you can't find us, okay, right? If you can't find a group, let me know and I'll put you in one of the group there, all right? Yeah, any questions? All good? Yeah. Pardon me? April 7th.